This month on the World Sailing Show, an epic win. A crushing blow. Some very cool kit. And hasn't been flogged for more than, you know, X number of hours. What's up in the cup? And the heat is on in Miami. Terrifying having an alligator, though. <laughs>In July last year, 17 skippers had set out on a 30,000 mile single-handed race around the world. After a slow start, the race had been brutal in parts, forcing 12 retirements. But now, after 200 days at sea, the leader Jean-Luc Van Den Heed was about to write his name into the record books. As he crossed the finish in Les Sables de Lonne on the west coast of France, He'd won the 2018 Golden Globe race. At 73, he'd become the oldest person ever to compete in such a race. But he'd also beaten the time set by the first non-stop circumnavigator, Sir Robin Knox Johnson, set in the original Golden Globe race in 1969. Van den Heed's impressive trip had been made in a similar sized boat to Sir Robin's, with no modern navigational aids yet he'd sliced a hundred days off the original record. But success had been no accident for the French sailor. This was his sixth solo lap of the planet. He'd been pushed hard by Dutch sailor Mark Slats, who closed down a huge lead to just 100 miles with 1,500 miles left to go. But as the pair approached the finish in France, Van den Heed's route around a weather system in the Atlantic allowed him to pull ahead once more to finish 400 miles ahead of Slats. And when he did, a huge flotilla ventured out into the cold, wet January weather to welcome him back to his home port. While thousands lined the harbour walls. And the man who started it all was there to see it. Well, I mean, look at the crowds. It's just <laughs> it's a fantastic job. reception, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. not a weekend, you know? Yeah, yeah, look at yeah. the number of people who've come out. Fantastic. It really is. Yeah, really well, he deserves it. Last month, we looked back at this extraordinary race around the world. Now it was time to hear from the winning skipper. I'm happy to be here. The course has been C'était vraiment étrange, je sais pas du tout ce, que je, ce à quoi je m'attendais. Vous êtes faire partir Non. Voilà. <rire> la, réponse, la réponse est nette. Est-ce que tu as quand même pris du Pourquoi plaisir dans cette course Ah oui, 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 ah, oui, 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 oui. Je, je la referai pas, mais Pourquoi, euh, pas comment pas. Parce que je suis trop vieux. Pas déconner, dans 4 ans. Non, euh, non. Euh, non. Euh, si, une, euh, fois non. Suffit, une fois suffit, une fois suffit. Yeah, one is enough. Donc, euh, et, 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 de toute façon, j'ai plus rien à gagner parce que vous avez vu ma progression. Au premier Vendée Globe, j'ai fait 3, au deuxième, j'ai fait 2, et celle-ci, je fais 1. Donc, je peux rien Bravo gagner. <rire> Van den Heed's age and experience said a great deal about why his win had attracted such attention. 50 years earlier, Sir Robin had made history as he won the original Golden Globe. Both Knox Johnson and Van Den Heed hold circumnavigation records. Both are in their 70s, and now the pair stood side by side. Two and a half days later, Van Den Heed's rival Mark Slats finished the race. Competitors for seven months, now they're aboard the same boat as they shared their stories. The, the, the thing with these boats is there it's much different with a little light boat. Oh, there. sure. You know? <laughs> I know. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a complete different world uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the big boat. My other boat, whenever uh, something happened, I could leave it to, to the side onto the wave and not, you know, it will go by it like goes this. On and, uh, but it never rolls. Yes. Never. This boat, you have to really think about what you're doing all the time because it, it rolls. It, you can get rolled quick, and uh, you can, you know, you always have to keep uh, keep sailing fast. I think. You know? I had a line out. I threw a long line at the back at the beginning of the storm. I got the wave in the back of the boat, and I, and I looked. I, I just looked at the back. 
and I think the boat is not steering because the boat goes down a wave like this and then the line is like this. Uh, yes, there is a curve. There's a curve. Yes, yeah, and then yeah, the boat yeah, yeah. is trying to go back, but it doesn't go back quick. Yeah. But luckily it always kept working and uh, it always kept going, so uh, that was good. <laughs> like all the skippers, Slats had endured some frightening moments as he recounted one in particular at the bottom of the world. When the wind comes, it's, it, it got really quickly up to 60, 60 knots or something. Yeah. And then a wave crashes into the back of the boat and it breaks the back door. Mm -hmm. And the boat is uh, it's above the chart table, the water. Because when the, when, the boat, when the wave came in, the boat went like this on its side and the water just, you know, just came in and came in and came in. And, uh, and, and the boat was hitting over this side and it was till the ceiling on this side, till about here. Uh, like this you know and uh, yeah that was a pretty uh, <laughs> because then there was uh, it was still 12 hours for me of that storm still to come you know and this was only at the first hour you know and in the meantime that one hour I, I had the priorities first you know the wind vane was broken the lines were broken so the boat was not steering the boat was side on actually still trying to sail but waves are coming <sighs> and um, and well actually first I start hand steering so I put from this winch to that winch and from that winch to that winch and to the back, I put lines across the cockpit. Because I thought, you know, if I, then there's a line here and there's a line here, you know, and I, I, I just go steering. I will hand steer through this storm, you know, and I'll go hand steer. But it was dark and uh, at night and the, the waves were coming and I couldn't, I was not doing a good job with hand steering, you know, it was really hard. I got a massive knockdown, a big knockdown and uh, up to maybe 120 yeah. degrees. And I got thrown out of the boat on the side, mm -hmm. and I hang on the side, and then the boat comes back, and it just, I got get, go, like a catapult back into the boat, thrown onto the bottom of the cockpit. <laughs> really hard with my back, you know, and, uh, but that was really uh, one of the scarier moments, I think, you know, uh, of, of this trip. Meanwhile, for some, the finish was still a long way off. Uku Randemar and Isvan Kopa were still battling it out off the coast of Brazil, while Finnish sailor Tapio Lettinen was just rounding Cape Horn. The Golden Globe is a long and demanding race, whichever era you do it in. Last year, the Spindrift team suffered a crushing blow to their attempt at setting a new outright circumnavigation record to win the Jules Verne Trophy after losing their mast at the start. One year later, and they were back. The 40-metre monster trimaran had been rebuilt and reconfigured. Skipper Jan Guichard and his 11 crew were ready to take on the world once again. Their start provided the perfect slingshot south, allowing them to pass through the notorious windless doldrums without stopping. As they entered the deep south and prepared to turn east for the long, fast run through the Southern Ocean, they were ahead of the record pace. Their prospects looked good. And then, disaster. Deep in the Southern Ocean, as the team passed the remote Kerguelen Islands, the starboard rudder stock broke between the two supporting bearings inside the boat. The giant tri had become difficult to steer. So, with little control over the boat and concerns for the remaining rudder, the team limped to Australia. Their Jules Verne campaign was over. Nous voilà, nous voilà à Perth après cinq jours de convoyage suite à la décision d'abandonner tristement ce, ce trophée Jules Verne dû à une avarie de, de Safran sur le Safran Trigor dans les mers du Sud. Donc voilà, c'est un sport mécanique, c'est vrai que c'est dur d'accepter ça, mais on va se relever, on va repréparer le bateau au mieux et pour continuer les belles aventures sur ce maxi spirituel. Still to come, more big news in the America's Cup. And the pressure builds in Miami.
It might be winter up here in the colder, darker latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, but the World Sailing Show has been busy. We've been on the road, visiting some of Europe's biggest shows. And alongside the glitz and the glamour among the sparkling topsides in the boat show halls, there's been a wealth of clever and intriguing new products released for 2019. So here's our guide to some of the cool kit for the coming season. First up is an innovative device from equipment manufacturer Spinlock that can tell you more about your sails than you've ever known before. Around the size of a matchbox, the self-powered Bluetooth-enabled sail sense unit is attached to the corner of a sail and records how much the sail has been used, along with the temperature and sunlight that it's been exposed to. The data is then sent to a mobile phone app which can even locate the sail in a jam-packed sail locker. The sail sense unit itself is just a very simple, it's a Bluetooth technology, we have various accelerometers in there, some sensors, the UV sensors, and all it's going to do, really do, is when you, when you put it on the sail, if the sail is in a sail bag, it knows it's not in use. As the sail suddenly sees UV, it's in use. So all these times when we've dropped the sail, we think it's not in use, it's sat on the deck, it will still say on the app, you're in use because of sunshine. If you then hoist it and it starts moving, you're in use because of sunshine and movement. So it's monitoring the, the in-use time of the data, and that's something that's never, ever been done before. It's always, always, always recording. If you want to see where it is, you just need to go within about 45 metres of it, and it'll update to your app how much the sail's actually been used. So the flogging of the sail is just really the accelerations that we get as it flaps around in the wind, much like a flag does. And that's never, ever been really been monitored. So, and that's crucial in that the amount of flogging just fatigues the sail. So we all, when we buy a sail, we're told it will last three years. But if you use it every day, it's going to last less. If you use it once every blue moon, it's going to last a lot longer. We've got lots of systems out there that can tell you when the sail has actually changed shape. Where we can actually, what we, we can with sail sense, is we can say what's happened, what's caused that. So the flogging just stretches the sail. And ultimately the sail is out of life when it's out of shape. Quantifying a sail's life is a big step forward, but as Charlie Carter explains, it also brings the sport into line with other activities, where data is king. Data is massively important. It's the, the technology revolution. It's no longer just the America's Cup teams and the, the, the high budget, high performance elite who are using data collection and analysis. The everyday sailor not even necessarily just the racers, you know, people are interested in data just because it's there and it's available. We often refer to it as the Strava effect, you know, you might not be really interested in improving your performance, but because there's some data on your performance, you're going to follow it up and, uh, and look at it and, and, uh, and, and judge yourself and, and measure it up against your previous performances. But it's not just about performance. The data could help those looking to buy and sell. The sale for sale, only two years old doesn't really mean a thing. You know, you know the people, you might know how they used it, but you will have no idea what the service history of that sale is. So now you can say, sale, lightly used, only done 27 hours, it's been used for 4% of its life, and hasn't been flogged for more than, you know, X number of hours. So it just gives you a really a full service history, and that's really important for the club racers, and also for the cruising boats. Keeping your eyes out of the boat and fixed on the route ahead can be hard when there are so many distractions elsewhere. GPS, chart plotters, radar and the collision avoidance system AIS have been some of the biggest steps forward for leisure craft. Yet it's still down to us humans to link this data to the real world. And it's not always easy to make the connection between the two. From poor weather to cluttered screens, making sense of the instruments can be tough. But a new system from marine electronic giants Ray Marine provides a much clearer picture. Clear Crew's augmented reality combines the data available on the instrument network with a live view of the real world gained from a stabilised camera on deck. Among the information available on the split screen display, navigational buoys can be identified. Using the AIS data, other vessels can be positively identified along with information on how close you're past them. But it's not just about what you can see up ahead. The system allows you to see round corners and provides early warnings for targets you can't yet see, 
like vessels on the other side of a headland. Waypoint navigation is also displayed so that you can relate your heading to a feature ahead. You can customise the display. And in an emergency, the system provides an effective aid to recovery. It's a sailor's worst nightmare, especially for those sailing double-handed. Down below or off watch, it's easy to be unaware that your crewmate has gone overboard until it's too late. But a new, simple and affordable system provides an instant alert. When the Bluetooth connection between a wrist sensor and the phone it is paired to is broken, an alarm is triggered. And the mobile phone app guides the rescuers back to the man overboard. The overboard location alert system was developed by Exposure Marine. But now the company has integrated the wrist technology into a strobe light and a torch. And while the new torch can be used as a personal device, it can also be attached to safety gear. All of which can be paired with the smartphone app, which automatically provides crucial data for a man overboard recovery. Electric winches and push-button controls have made sailing considerably easier. But this is a luxury that often requires deep pockets. A push-button playground is expensive. But now an ingenious electric winch handle provides extra muscle power wherever you might need it, without having to change anything on board your boat. The e-wincher is based on a conventional winch handle but has a removable, rechargeable lithium battery and an electric motor inside. At 25 centimetres long, the handle is a standard size, which means it will fit into existing deck layouts. Two buttons on the handle control the two-speed electric motor, which winds the winch while the handle is held in place. Alternatively, the handle can be operated either completely manually or in conjunction with the powered system to get maximum line speed. And in keeping with most modern technology, there's an app to monitor the handle's performance and set limits. And finally, they're all the rage ashore, but how about an underwater drone? Driven in much the same way as an airborne drone, albeit with a cable rather than a wireless link, Power Vision's Power Ray underwater drone has a 4K camera and lights and records straight onto an SD memory card. A handy device for underwater inspections. The list of challengers for the 36th America's Cup has been bolstered with the news of a sixth campaign. Dutch sail, led by former cup sailor and Volvo Ocean Race skipper Simeon Tienpont. Taking the helm, double female World Sailor of the Year and recent Volvo Ocean Race winner Carolyn Brewer will be the first female cup challenger to do so, as Team The Netherlands represents two Dutch yacht clubs. Tienpont has also signed Dirk Kramers as the lead designer. Kramers has been involved in six America's Cup wins, including victories with Alinghi and Oracle Team USA. Also on the Dutch team and also from Alinghi, two-time Olympian Peter van Nekerk is team manager. In addition, the Netherlands will host a World Series event in The Hague in 2020. As some parts of the United States recorded record-breaking freezing temperatures, Miami, Florida had a gentle, warm Caribbean breeze, providing perfect light wing conditions for those eyeing up an Olympic medal in just 18 months' time. This was round two of the 2019 Hempel World Cup Series.
Just before racing started on the second event of the season, sailors described why they were taking the Miami event seriously. This is an important regatta for the Americans because we're on our home soil, so we have a lot of you know great support here. Uh, it's also really important because it's the first phase of our test event qualifications. We've had an up and down relationship with Miami, but we won last year, so we definitely want to go for a repeat. Um, and you know, two uh, win two World Cups in a row would be pretty nice too. There is a resident alligator. Um, there's some manatees around, and uh, yeah, lots going on. It's terrifying having an alligator, <laughs> though. Good chance for us to sail longer hours. It's more warm than Europe, and it's always a great event. So it's really nice to be here. Out on the water, there were old favourites and new faces topping the score sheet. In the 49ers, German duo Heil and Plosel took three out of 11 race wins, giving them a convincing gold over the British and the Croatians. We are really happy to start 2019 like this, and even though it was a light event, and... We are heavy. Yeah, uh, we are heavy. <laughs> In the 49er FX, Kiwis Maloney and Meech have been putting down strong scores all week, only to see their gold medal slip away on the final leg of the final race to the Olympic champions. We went in with a pretty good buffer and I think we kind of gave it away out there. So overall, we'll be happy with a bit of time with this Miami because we sailed pretty well, but pretty disappointed with the final race. We always sail very close to each other and we also train together. Um, so I think it's always been a battle for quite a while and, and it's, it's super nice to have like these uh, close battles on the race course, uh, especially when you come with the wind, but still it's very nice to race with Alex and Molly. In the laser fleet, one man dominated the week's racing, only once dropping below sixth place on his way to the medal race. Norway's Herman Thomasgaard finished the event 47 points ahead of second place Sam Meech. I tried to really look up the course, try to see if I see any any wind or whatever, and then uh, yeah, and then also during the race change the plan. If if it's not correct, you change the plan completely. Chinese sailors Yong Shi Lu and Bing Yi picked up gold in the RSX class while Dongshong Zhang won in the laser radials. Sweden's Max Salmanen won a Scandinavian battle in the Finn class. In the men's 470s, the Spanish pair, Jordi Chama and Nicolas Rodriguez, added another win to their long list. In the women's 470, German pair Frederica Lowe and Anna Markfoot took gold. In the mixed foiling cat class, the NACRA 17, Brazilians Albrecht and Nicolino de Sá won 5 out of 13 races. But a disqualification on race 8 left them just behind the Australians, Waterhouse and Darmanin. When we come to the Hempel World Cup Series in Miami is that we can get these light wind conditions and sure enough it, it, it came, which we're really happy about. The goal of coming here was to improve those skills and we certainly learned a lot. Next stop for the Hempel World Cup Series is Genoa, Italy, in April. Next month, first steps for a radical cruiser.